All right, we're back for part two. My name's Nathan LaValle. This is Theology for Teens. I hope you viewed the first one. If not, I'll link it above. We are covering the final five of the 10 biggest objections that Gen Z has to Christianity. Now, I explained in the first video, I have not read these ahead of time. I have not prepared answers. In a sense, I'm quizzing myself. I wanna know how well I would do at answering these objections. And I think you should do the same. If you're a Gen Z person, ask yourself, am I prepared for my friends to engage with me on these topics? If they say, hey, I would be a Christian, but in one of these reasons, are you prepared to answer that objection? And if you're not Gen Z, if you're an older person, I wouldn't imagine you're younger than Gen Z watching this, but if you're an older person, you can ask, am I ready for the young people in my life to bring these questions to me? Am I fostering an environment where they even would bring these to me? And if they were to, am I ready to answer and address these objections? So the final five, let's hope they're good. Here we go. The first one, sexism. Okay, some perceive Christianity as promoting traditional gender roles that limit women's rights and opportunities. Okay, this is great. Um, so is Christianity sexist? Well, it depends on what you mean by sexist. See, Christianity and the religious documents of the Bible took place in history. And so we see a lot of things in scripture that I would certainly stand next to you and say that's sexist. I think about the defiling of, of Dina in the Old Testament in Genesis. This is not okay. She is just taken. She is viewed as an object. Her brothers don't really do anything about it until they just slaughter all the people. It's a big mess. That's sexist. But we also have to ask, is scripture saying that that's okay? Well, no, it's not saying that that's okay. So not everything in scripture is a prescription, meaning that you should do that. Much of it is descriptive. Now, that doesn't fully get us out of this question and this objection because there are things in scripture that are prescriptive that speak to gender roles. Now, you essentially have three different camps here. You have egalitarians, and these are people who view scripture through a lens that says man and woman has been eliminated. There are no role differences or differences in authority between men and women in any environment. And that could be a valid position. We would have to ask, is it? The other kind of middle position is complementarianism, which says despite the fact that God liberated women, and provided them with sonship, um, he also does have a specific design for different sectors, oftentimes the church and the home, as far as authority structure. Not value structure, authority structure. Then you have patriarchalists who would say all those same things, but they would say it a lot harsher and a lot meaner and take it further in, in a bad way, in my view. They would say, uh, you know, if you are a man, you need to make sure you find a man to ask directions because it's not okay for a woman to give you directions because that'd be exercising authority and we get into these weird places. Now, I just want to bluntly recommend, if you're really curious about this, Mike Winger did an excellent, what is it, 13 video series on this question as far as what does the Bible teach. I land in the same place that he did, largely because I listen to this and his work was incredible on this topic. I think egalitarianism uh, is in many ways a sham and a misunderstanding of scripture, uh, misrepresentation of the data, misrepresentation of historical documents, sometimes on purpose, maybe a lot on accident. And so I land in a soft complementarian place. Now, this is why I started this question by saying it depends what you mean by sexist. Is it sexist to say that God designed things in such a way where the relationship between husband and wife would pay homage to the relationship between Christ and the church, in which Christ has more authority, but the church has lots of intrinsic value. In fact, Christ dies for the... Is that wrong for God to say, I'm setting up marriage to, to show that? Uh, is that sexist? I don't think that's sexist. Maybe you do. Maybe you think that's sexist. I think it's beautiful that there is a representation of that beautiful relationship between Christ and the church present in my marriage. And uh, anyways, we could go much deeper into this. We would need to define sexism. What does that even mean? And would it be sexist for God to do something like what I just described? Would it be sexist for him to say that he desires for men to be in the highest role of authority 
in church. Also, we would just have to ask, what does the Bible say about this? If we are Christians, we're holding to the Bible. What does it say? That's our primary authority. Okay, let's move on. There's a lot more that can be said. I didn't do a great job uh, with that one. It would need to be more conversational, I think, with someone else. Seven, anti-science beliefs. Certain Christian groups reject scientific consensus on topics like evolution or climate change, which can turn off Gen Z individuals who value scientific understanding. No, this, this is a great objection because I actually think um, Christians have really done bad at this in recent years. Now, you can look at groups like Answers in Genesis who take a young earth position and they try to really do a good job of specifying how holding to that position is logical. And I mean, I, I wouldn't say I have a ton of respect for that um, because of what I think is going on behind the scenes with that. But I have more respect for that than someone who just says, the Bible says seven days, the earth is 6,000 years old. You either believe it or you are going against scripture. Um, it, it's just not that clear what Genesis is saying as far as the age of the earth because the sun wasn't created until halfway through the week and that's how we define our days and one day to god is like a thousand years to man so we have some issues here uh, that are genuine in the text of scripture as far as old earth young earth evolution not evolution now it would be very helpful in these conversations, and it has been very helpful in my conversations, to actually bring in some awareness of evolution because we've basically had three major waves of understanding of evolutionary theory. What Darwin proposed required a divine being. In fact, he said that without God, this does not make sense. What followed after Darwin and the origin of species was Neo-Darwinianism, which made bigger jumps and precluded, I don't even know if that's a word, it, it stated that God is not real. It was a naturalistic leaning of evolutionary theory. Now, I'm very excited for William Lane Craig's systematic theology to come out because he's done a lot of work on evolution. And something he says, and he seems trustworthy on this topic, is that there is an astronomical amount of evidence evidence for different evolutionary processes um, and and that turning away from those and saying no 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 that's not good is just a rejection of mountains and mountains of evidence so i think for each of these issues whether it be evolution climate change the age of the earth we need to take them at a case-by-case -case basis we need to ask what the bible says absolutely but we need to also ask what are we seeing around us what is the evidence that's lining up and if it seems like there is a huge mismatch there we've got our work cut out for us of understanding what that looks like so i think yes this is a valid objection that gen z people have as far as anti-science beliefs but i think the antidote for this is, as believers, us being well-versed and well-read as far as science and why we believe what we believe. So if you're going to hold to a young earth position, you better make sure that you are ready to defend that and you're ready to explain the mountain of evidence for evolutionary theory. Um, and not just neo-Darwinianism, the, the third wave or first wave of evolutionary theory, which is much more compatible with Christian theism. All right, let's move on to number eight incompatibility with modern values. Some Gen Z may believe that Christianity's moral codes are outdated, particularly when it comes to issues like sex before marriage or use of contraceptives. Okay, I think with use of contraceptives there, we are making reference probably to the Catholic Church, which states no contraceptions whatsoever, or contraceptives whatsoever. Okay, so is incompatibility with modern values bad? I mean, I don't think modern values are good, so I would view incompatibility with them as a good start. And I think that would be the place that I would start with a Gen Z person asking me about this. You know, how can I be a Christian when it's just so different from what we believe today? Great, what is it that we believe today that's different? And as I get them to unpack that, whether it be their uses of technology or the sexual ethic that's running rampant right now and destroying people's lives, whether it be you know the, the, um, the lack of morals today and saying that things like pornography okay, which are just destroying marriages and people's sexual drives, I mean, lots of things, really bad. We can get to the bottom of those values they're talking about and we can ask, are those really good values? 
we have to be prepared. We have to be quick on our feet. We have to be ready to answer these questions. And so it would behoove us to do that ahead of time. Are you prepared to talk about the Western dating ethic that is so rampant, hookup culture that is so rampant? Are you listening to podcasts where people are engaging in discussion of these things? Are you uh, watching different commentators who bring atheistic perspectives on these topics to see what they're saying? That would be very helpful. I don't view incompatibility with modern values as a bad thing. And that's what I would try to get a Gen Z person to see. We need something different than modern values. Modern values are not working out so well. And that is very clear in many different areas. It is not clear in certain other areas. I would bring out an example like this. I would say when cigarettes were first introduced, people said they were healthy for you. People did not think that they were bad, but as time went on and as we saw the consequences and effects of chain smoking on people's lungs, we saw that it is not a good thing to be doing. It's not healthy. And so many of the things in our modern world, we are experiencing the same thing. Europe is many years ahead of America with regards to the transgender movement. And we are seeing in Europe a huge wave saying we were wrong pump the brakes. This is not good to allow youth to transition. It ends up being really bad as far as their health outcomes, their life expectancy, their mental health, all kinds of things. And so I think we are in a place where so many things have been introduced with modern values and modern ethics that in 50 years, we're going to be looking back on going, what were we thinking? And I think I can get a youth often. I think always I've been able to get youth to see that and go, okay, yeah, maybe it would be good to have something more stable than modern values. Okay, number nine, two left. Here we go. Lack of, oh, I should say on the last one, I'm not with the Catholic Church as far as all contraceptives being bad. We could talk about that more uh, and where life begins and, and what that looks like. Anyways, nine, lack of diversity. Wait, I just realized I made that sound different. L let's talk about that for a moment. When I say I'm not with the Catholic Church, I'm not with the Catholic Church as far as condoms being bad, okay? I'm not with the Catholic Church in terms of all sexual activity needs to be for procreation. Um, that is not my position. I view the moment of conception as the origin of life, and the condom doesn't interfere with that after the moment of conception. It's prior to that. Um, and so, I'm different than the Catholic Church as far as my position on contraceptives, but I do hold to something that would be a clash with modern values, which is that abortion is not okay, abortion is wrong, that the moment of conception is the instigation of human life, it's the beginning of human life, and that scripture shows us that human life is valuable, and those two things make me an abolitionist with regards to abortion, that I think it should be abolished and that it should be criminalized. And that is a very controversial claim. Now, we could talk about that, right? Same thing with the other issues we talked as far as incompatibility with modern values. Are the modern values that say abortion is good, are those modern values good? Like, is it causing good fruit in our society? Is it actually helping people? Are abortions a good thing? Uh, and, and that is a deeper conversation that we need to be well versed in. And I'm just telling you, if you are trying to engage with Gen Z youth, you need to be prepared on the topic of abortion. You need to be ready. So I would recommend studying up on that. All right, number nine. Sorry for going back twice. Lack of diversity and inclusion. The perceived lack of acceptance towards different races, cultures, or lifestyles can be a turnoff for this generation who highly value diversity and inclusion. Okay, so we just would ask, what do you mean by diversity? What do you mean by inclusion? If by diversity you mean the equal valuing of people of diverse backgrounds, then actually Christianity is like a forerunner in that. Christianity first went to Africa before it came to America, like way before it came to America, before it went to Europe. Christianity is a very diverse religion in terms of the people who hold to it, but also diverse in terms of its views of mankind and its views of the valuing of mankind. Uh, in addition to that, as far as different cultures, um, 
you know, as soon as the Christian church begins, it spreads out to different cultures and it goes to different cities that have different cultures. And each of those churches have different issues, but they're willing to work with that and accommodate those things and address them in the New Testament, in the letters that were written to these churches. And so we actually see a great diversity. We also see diversity in the second coming of Christ that men of every nation will be raised and that when Jesus gives the Great Commission as far as spreading of the gospel, that it's to every single nation that people are sent out. And so in Christianity, we see diversity as far as how I defined diversity. Now, if we define diversity as forcing equal representation of every different subgroup of people, um, you know, there could be an argument about that. I've heard Christians who hold to something like that, affirmative action in every different sphere, and I've heard Christians who don't like affirmative action and see it as actually being more racist than what it's trying to fix. So there's lots of room for debate on those issues. You can be a Christian and hold to affirmative action being a good thing. Um, as far as uh, inclusion, this is another word that we would have to define. What do we mean by inclusivity? If we mean that anyone of any belief, uh, that, that we are just going to say their belief is good, no, we don't affirm that as Christians. And I don't think, like, you really would either if you thought about it. Do you really affirm that any belief is good? Well, then you say, well, as long as it's not hurting someone, it's good. Okay, that's not inclusive. That is not inclusive. Here we are making judgment. But like we talked about in part one, Christianity is a very inclusive religion in the sense that everyone can come to the Father regardless of what positions you held before. Does that make sense? When you come to the Father through Jesus, all you have to do is believe in Jesus and allow him to begin forming you. And so Jesus ate with sinners. He ate with people who were the outcasts of society. And so Christianity is an inclusive religion, but not in the way the world defines inclusivity. The world by inclusivity um, means something very different than, than what we would mean within Christianity for inclusivity. So is there a lack of diversity and inclusion? It depends on what you mean by those words. And I am prepared on both of those fronts for conversations with Gen Z and helping them see the difference between what Christian diversity looks like in worldly diversity and what Christian inclusion looks like in worldly inclusion looks like. All right, point 10, institutionalized religion. Many Gen Zers reject institutionalized religion in general because they see it as corrupt or overly focused on money and power rather than spiritual growth. Great. Yeah, I agree. I think that there is a lot of institutionalized religion that is all about money. And I get angry. I get angry at megachurch pastors who have used their platform as a means of procuring wealth for themselves in a way that is dishonest as far as paying taxes. Uh, and, and this makes me frankly sick. I've followed some of these things somewhat closely as far as different prejuries and trials that have gone on with megachurch pastors who've had exorbitant spending of donor money uh, for mansions, for vacations, uh, for, for limousines, for shoes. And frankly, it makes me sick. I don't think it's good. I am with you. But we have to make sure we're not throwing out the baby with the bathwater because despite the fact that there are a lot of churches that are corrupt, there are a lot of churches that are good. Now, realize that there's two kind of different ideas of churches. Here we're talking about groups of people that gather in a specific place weekly. That's what I mean by church. But there's also the global church, which is, you know, who Christ died for. Christ died for, well, all people, but the people who are going to accept that are the people that are part of the global church. And so in the sense of the global church, we have to realize that that is Christ's bride. We should not just go about bashing the local or, or the global church. We should not go about bashing the global church as Christians. We should be ready to call out injustice, to call out people who are abusing their power. Absolutely. These are Christian things. But we also need to be prepared to defend the global church because that's the bride of Christ. And frankly, we don't have the privilege and right of criticizing the bride of Christ. So yes, I am with Gen Z in the sense of lots of bad things have been done by the church, local church, 
But in terms of the global church, the global church is beautiful. It is a beautiful thing. It is people of all different races, ethnicities, different languages engaging in a process of worshiping the one true creator who is God over all. And so you can find churches or institutionalized religion. You can find local churches that are true members of the global church. And I would encourage you to do that because frankly, you need Christian community. And when the author of Hebrews says to not neglect meeting as is the habit of some, but encourage one another, he knew what he was talking about. We need community and fellowship with other Christian believers on a daily basis because times are getting worse and worse as far as the cultural pressures that are stirring. We're in a vacuum, in a pressure chamber. I know those are like opposites, but we're in something that is difficult. And so I want to encourage you, uh, and, and this would be what I'd be saying to the Gen Z person, to find a local church that is representative of the beautiful global church of Christ. And those exist. I've seen those and you can find those, but you have to work at it. You can't just say, I went to one church, all churches are bad. Or I heard one bad story, all local churches are bad. That is not the case. Okay, so these have been the 10 biggest objections that Gen Z has to Christianity. It's been very interesting. This kind of came out how I thought it might. I have talked about a lot of these different issues, all of these different issues, but a lot of them many, many times with youth. And so, how did you come out in this video? Did you feel prepared to answer those five objections in a way that a youth would understand, a Gen Z person would engage with? Or did you feel like some of those stumped me? If so, comment down below. Also, do not forget to subscribe, to hit that subscribe button so that you can get more content like this delivered directly to you on a weekly basis. My name's Nathan Valley. It's been Theology for Teens. We'll see you in the next one.